got waves that are tossing me, crashing all over my beliefs. And in all sincerity, Lord, I want to be yours. Mm. So pull me out of this mess I'm in, because I know I'm wandering. Leave my soul back home again. Morning, Grace Place. Is there anybody out there? I can't see anybody. I'm not Phil. I'm John. I'm usually upstairs. The tech team has invaded the worship team. There we go. Everybody stand up. Let's pray. Rebecca's going to start us. Go.
Gotta wake up. Let's go.
glad my Redeemer lives. Does your Redeemer live this morning? Because He lives not only for the wonderful plan of salvation, but He is there for every single thing that's going on in your life, your life, your life, my life. He's there for us. He is our Savior. He is our God. He is our strength. Let's sing it to Him in this next song. Let's worship him and sing to the king.
you may be seated. I have a dream. Well, good morning and <clears throat> welcome to the Grace Place and thank you so much for being here today. And February is Black History Month and we're going to take some time over the next few weekends and highlight the achievements of some people who um, have really made a great difference in our nation and in all of our lives. And so we'll be highlighting that. We wanted a little introduction this weekend and um, I think it's very important for us to celebrate um, all the things that um, are a part of of uh, the, you know, the blending of our cultures in America. And um, as I've said many times, whenever you understand the Great Commission that Jesus gives us, uh, the Great Commission just simply eliminates the option for any kind of racial um, um, racism in our lives. And um, so I think it's extremely important for us as believers to simply operate in exactly that same kind of way. Um, this also is Super Bowl Sunday, and I don't know, I don't feel like it's so super because my teams aren't anywhere around it, but, you know, but I do know who I want to lose anyway. How about that? All right. You know, so I'm not going to tell you who it is because I make at least half of you mad, but, um, that's all right. But anyway, so it is Super Bowl Sunday and we do, um, welcome you to a Super Sunday. How about that? All right. And we got some great things that we're going to do today that I know you're going to be blessed by. And um, I want to say a big thank you to John Sexton and the team for leading us in worship. Phil and Crystal are taking a much-needed break this weekend, and so John's agreed to um, to help us out, and he's done a great job, and we want to let him know that. So let's just give him a big hand to do that. <clears throat> So, but anyway, great to have you here. If you're a first time attender, welcome to the Grace Place and thank you so much for coming today. And I'd like to ask you before you leave to stop by Guest Central, which is in the northwest corner of our lobby. We have a gift we'd like to give you just to say thank you for being our guest today. And then if you're a regular attender, we welcome you and thank you so much for being here. And I'd like to ask all of us to take our program out now and tear that section off the back. Would you do that, please? And if you put your name on the front of it and there are place for prayer requests that you can put on there, if you'll put those on there and turn that in, we'll be praying about those needs this week. We believe that God hears and not only hears, but does answer our prayers. So I want to encourage you to do that, and we'll be praying for those needs. Um, I'll be praying for them personally, and, and there's others that will be praying for them collectively. So I want to encourage you to do that. And when the offering buckets are passed in a little while, you can then um, you can put those in the offering buckets. Um, again, it's great to see you in worship. Put your name tag on, please. Let's stand up. Find about a half a dozen people and tell them you wish them a happy Super Bowl. How about that? All right.
Let's continue our worship this morning. The splendor of a king. Think about that. Clothed in majesty, and he is your savior. same time as community group. What are we going to do? What movie did you want to go see? What are you doing for retirement? Should we put dad in a nursing home or should one of us keep him? 
What are you doing this weekend? Where are you going on vacation? Do you think we should ask them to church? So who are you voting for? Do you think you can forgive them? We gonna do, do you think we should ask what them to church? What movie did you want to go see? Paper? Regular Love Decaf. What are you doing where this weekend? Going on vacation? What are you doing for retirement? What college are you going so to? Are you so where do you want to eat? Do you think you can forgive them? You know, choices and decisions are all a part of our lives, and it seems to me that we just have more and more choices um, in just about every venue of our life. And, um, you know, it affects everything from fast food joints to churches. And, uh, and the reality is that we, as a culture, demand a variety of options. I remember, and I know I'm dating myself big time with this, but I remember going to McDonald's when your choices boil down to being this. A hamburger without cheese or with cheese, <laughs> French fries, and a milkshake. And then I remember whenever they introduced the fish sandwich, that was like they had a lot of variety on their menu. Go to McDonald's today, and you'll just see there's a few more options than there used to be. And, um, you know, there's just all of these decisions and choices that we have to make and, um, you know, and some of those are very simple and easy decisions and very easy choices, <clears throat> at least for most people. Um, but there are a lot of decisions and a lot of choices we have to make that are very, very challenging and very difficult to make. And, you know, we live in a multiple choice culture and, you know, there are some very, very um, significant decisions that we make. And um, some of them can ha- be life changing um moments for many of us. And I decided to do just a little bit of research this week on some really bad decisions that have been made, you know, in the last 50 years. <clears throat> Sam Phillips sold a small recording company to RCA Records in 1955 for $35,000. It included an exclusive contract with a young man named Elvis Presley. So he unknowingly forfeited the royalties from more than one billion recordings that were sold. I would call that a bad decision, wouldn't you? (laughs) Tom Selleck turned down the role for Indiana Jones. I'd call that a bad decision. In 1936, Joe Schuster and Jerry Siegel sold the rights to Superman for $65 each. I would call that a bad decision, wouldn't you? And a thief in Boston attempted to steal two live Maine lobsters by stuffing them down into his pants. I would call that a very bad decision. And then I heard about a bank robber in Germany who went in with a gun to hold up this bank, and the teller told him she'd have to see his ID before she'd give him the money. So he handed her the ID, walked out of there with the money, leaving his ID with the teller. I'd call that a bad decision. And women don't hate me. But if your wife asks you if she looks fat in that dress, you better be careful what you say. Or it could be a very bad decision. All right. Okay. You know, life is really made up of choices, and success is largely a matter of making some very wise choices. Um, A guy named Frank Borum said, we make our decisions, and then our decisions make us. And that's just the way it works. And I think the key to making wise decisions is found in Proverbs chapter 2, verses 3, 5, and 9. And in the Living Bible's paraphrase, this is how it's paraphrased. If you want better insight and discernment, learn the importance for the reverence of the Lord and of trusting Him. He shows how to distinguish right from wrong and how to find the right decision every time. And so if you want to make good decisions, then it's important to listen to what God has to say. And today we're going to look at six very practical ways that we can evaluate a decision as to whether or not it is the right decision or not. 
And so I want to start by just asking us some questions, and only you can answer these questions. But they're very important questions to ask, and if you're making a decision right now, or if you're not right now, you will be before very long, ask yourself this question. Does this decision violate any biblical principles? And I use the word any very specifically. Does it violate any biblical principles? Not, you know, some biblical principles that violate any. You know, and see, you have to choose the ultimate authority in your life. Is it the Word of God or is it the world? And, you know, based on our life decisions, and, you know, some of us choose to do kind of the end thing rather than choosing to do the biblical thing. And I would tell you that, you know, the end thing is as out of date as, you know, tomorrow. But if you make decisions that are based upon the principles of Scripture, God's truth never changes, the Bible tells us. In fact, if God said something was right 10,000 years ago, it's right today. If he said it was wrong 10,000 years ago, it is wrong today. Because God makes it very clear that there are some things that are very important for us to understand about what he has to say about life and how it ought to be lived and the values that we ought to live our lives by. Could I just point out to you, you do not break God's laws. God's laws break you. And, you know, there are moral laws and there are spiritual laws. And God built his universe around those laws, not because he's a precious God and arbitrary. He understands us and he says, listen, these are for your benefit. And there's a lot of times that I think we look at some of God's principles and say, that doesn't make sense. Well, I will tell you, it's because you haven't analyzed it. Because over the years, as I've had person after person come to me, and, you know, they're violating biblical principles in their lives, and they're justifying it. Whenever we begin to talk, and I begin to explain the reason behind God saying the things that he says, and helping us to understand that his principles are not given to make our lives miserable. His principle is given. His principles are given so that we can have life and have it to the very full and live life to the very max. And so you can take his principles. It doesn't matter what they are. If you live by them, you will succeed in life and life will be easier. If you reject them, if you disobey them, if you ignore them, then you're the one who gets hurt. You know, I can stand up here and tell you that I do not believe in the law of gravity. In fact, I could say I simply do not believe in it, so I'm going to find a building at least six stories high and I'm going to jump off to prove to you that I don't believe in the law of gravity. Well, let me let you a little secret. The law of gravity is a law whether I believe in it or not. And if I jump off of that six-story building, not believing in the law of gravity, I can tell you this, I will be broken up by the law of gravity. That's just reality. I will break my legs, I'll probably break my back, I'll probably bust my head wide open, and you'll probably see me laying in that pine box. The reality is, you know, you don't break God's laws, God's laws break you. And I still remember that one of my sons was just talking about how stupid some of the laws that we have are. And I said, well, let me let you on a little secret. You can just go ahead and talk about how stupid they are, but in a time, you'll understand they're very real. And the reality boils down to being, that's the way it is. And, you know, there are moral laws and there are spiritual laws. You do not thumb your nose at God's principles and get away with it. You are just asking for trouble in your life if you violate the principles of God. And so you look at it when you're making a decision and you ask yourself, This very, very important question. You know, does this decision violate any biblical principles that God has laid out for us? See, when making a decision, the first question must be, what does God say about it? Psalm 119, 105. This is what the psalmist says. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. If God says it's okay, then I'm going to do it. If God says it isn't okay, then I'm not going to do it. It doesn't matter if 99% of the people in America think it's the right thing to do. If God says no, it is still the wrong thing to do. Now, we have a culture, we live in a culture that is just living by polls, it seems like. And I think that you see this on newscast all the time, and I believe that it's just a reflection of the fact that we have lost you know, our bearings as a culture. Because, you know, no longer are there absolute truths in our culture. Everything is relative. 
And so here's what they do. They take a poll and they say 68% of the Americans believe whatever it is they're talking about. Like just because 68% of the people around me think something's right doesn't mean that it is right. Because, see, God's principles are absolute. They are not politically correct. They are not expedient. They are absolute. And we need to stop and understand that. So we ask ourselves, does this violate any of God's biblical principles that he gives us? And, um, and that is where we have to start. You don't have to understand God's principles to be blessed by them. You just have to follow them. And sometimes following God's principles can seem very difficult from a human standpoint. And sometimes from a human standpoint, they don't seem to make sense. You know, so I have people say to Rick, me, you know, a lot of times, Rick, why does God say that you should only have sex in the context of marriage? You know, that seems like God's just trying to deny me of one of life's great pleasures. Well, the reality is, Whenever you stop and begin to understand why God talks about that in the scriptures and why he lays out those principles, you begin to understand there are some very basic foundational reasons why God says to do that. And, you know, and I've had conversation after conversation after conversation with people over that very issue. And the reality boils down to being, you simply need to understand. You don't even have to understand all of the reasons behind what God does, but if you are having questions about that, meet with me, and I can give you a bunch of very good reasons, logically, that you know are behind why God says not to do those things until you're married. And I'll be glad to meet with you and talk to you about it. But the reality is, he understands us better than we understand ourselves. And he understands how we are created. And he wants us to realize that if you will obey his principles, you will be blessed. If you don't obey them, you're the one who is going to hurt yourself. You will damage yourself and you will damage the things that mean the most to you. Now, there are some things that I understand about electricity. You know, I understand you have to have a positive and a negative and a variety of things about that. <clears throat> and, you know, and I can <clears throat> and I can wire things if I need to. But there are some things about electricity I don't understand. I don't understand how they can generate power in Kentucky, put it in a high-tension line, ship that to South Florida to 2080 Southwest Hackman Terrace, and how when I turn on my light switch, it knows that that electricity came from that plant in Kentucky. I still haven't figured that out. And <clears throat> I've asked some of you guys that work with that to tell me, and you've never given me a good enough answer yet for me to figure that out. <laughs> I know that's what happens, okay? I know that's what happens. I can tell you this. I don't have to understand how that grid works for me to go home today, and as hot as it is on February the 5th, to at least pretend it's winter outside my house. By turning that air conditioner down where it feels that way. <clears throat> you know, I don't have to understand how all that works for me to go turn the thermostat down or to flip on a light switch or to turn on my television. I don't have to understand how all that works to use it, all right? And you don't have to understand how all of God's principles work to use it. You just know they work if you apply them in your life. That is not saying put your brain in neutral. It's just helping us to understand that there are some things that God gives us that you may look at it and never figure it out. And like I say, on some of these issues, if you want to talk about it, I've worked through a lot of things and be glad to share it with you. But the reality is this. It's very important for us to understand that we can simply use things we don't understand. Now, I have a pretty good understanding of how an internal combustion engine, that's called the thing under the hood in your car, works. I understand how to do that. I've rebuilt a number of motors, and I understand all that stuff, how it works. But there are many of you that only understand this, that you get in your car, and you do this. You take your key out, and you put it in the ignition, and you turn it. And I know some of you got them things now where all you have to do is push a button, but I'm still driving the old stuff. How about that? All right. You know. So either you push the button and it starts up and you go. You don't have to understand what's going on with valves opening up and letting gas and air in and another valve opening up and letting exhaust out. You don't have to understand all that stuff. You don't have to understand how an explosion makes a piston go up and down. You don't have to understand that stuff to get in and use it. And the reality is that it's important for you to realize that, you know, when it comes to God's principles, you don't have to understand everything to realize that God has your best interest at heart and you need to ask yourself when you make a decision does this violate any biblical principles in my in in my life um 
And then I think the oldest temptation known to man is the temptation to doubt God's Word. And, you know, when we find something in the Bible that we don't like or we feel like it's restrictive, then we begin to say, well, that isn't really what the Bible says. Well, do you remember somebody else who said that? Back in the Garden of Eden, when Satan showed up, tempting Adam and Eve to take of the forbidden fruit, what did he say? Did God really say that? Is that what God really means? God's really trying to withhold something very, very good from you. I would just challenge you today to understand that, you know, God's word is absolute truth. I will live and die by the principles of this book. And I will either succeed or I will fail by whether or not I live out these principles in my life. And so will every one of us in this room. There's another question if you are making a decision that's important to ask, and that is, does this decision violate your integrity? In Proverbs 10, 9, this is what Solomon says. The man of integrity walks securely, but he who takes crooked paths will be found out. See, here's what I think is important to understand. A bad decision will make you worry about other people finding out what you have done. You know, you need to ask yourself this question. Would I want anyone else to know about this decision that I am making? You know, whenever I was um, growing up, my mom had the most incredible intuitions in the world. She really did. I don't know of anybody I've ever met that was more intuitive than she was. And, you know, she had the unique ability to know what you were doing without knowing what you were doing. And there were many, many things that I may have been tempted to do that this is what I'd say to myself. You know, Rick, it would be really stupid to do that because before you got home, your mom would know what happened. <laughs> now, she wouldn't know because she knew, but she didn't know because she didn't know. I know I'm saying that kind of crazy, but that's the way it was. That's just mom. That was her. She just do that. How in the world a little five foot two, 115, 20-pound woman raised four boys and one daughter by herself because God gave her that unbelievable intuition and I saw her time after time after time be dead on with those intuitions she had. Absolutely dead on. And I just want to encourage you to understand this, that it's important to understand whether you have a mom like that or, in my case, had a mom like that or not. It doesn't matter. You have a God who knows every single thing that's going on. And it's important then when you make a decision to ask yourself, if other people found out about what I did, how would that affect them? And so if you're making a decision where you have to worry about someone finding out what's going on, that is a very good indicator. It is a very bad decision. If it can't stand the light of day and it has to be tied to a secret somewhere that nobody else knows about, that I guarantee you is always 100% of the time the wrong decision. This proverb makes a statement that's very important. This is what he says. A man of integrity walks securely. Why does a man of integrity or a woman of integrity walk securely? Because they know their life is an open book. There is nothing hidden in their life. So they walk securely. They're not worried about being found out. But he who takes crooked paths will be found out will be he says he doesn't say maybe he says a person who takes crooked paths will be found out you remember king david had this sexual relationship with a woman named bathsheba and he thought he had hidden it really well but then nathan the prophet comes and he says you're the guy who did this and here's what david said what i did in secret has been shouted from the housetops. Every time I watch a politician get caught with whatever it is that they've done, I am reminded of that statement David makes. It's shouted from the housetops. Every time I see somebody of influence who, you know, caves in, I'm reminded that what they did in secret will be shouted from the housetops. So stop and ask yourself this question. Do I want that shouted from the housetops? Now, in our vernacular, do I want that in the newspaper? Or do I want that on the news? Or do, <coughs> or do I want that to hit forward on everybody's 
email inbox, okay? And that's what it is. And I just want to encourage you to stop and realize that you need to ask yourself, you know, will this decision violate your integrity? See, the test of integrity is does your public life and your private life match? You know, whatever it is that you basically present yourself to be publicly, you know, does your walk and your talk match? You know, do what you say and what you do, are they in harmony with each other? And the truth is, when it comes to integrity, you can fool other people, but you can't fool yourself. And you cannot violate your conscience without paying for it. And that's why Solomon says, the man of integrity walks securely, but the fool who takes crooked paths is going to be found out. And so you ask yourself this question, can you do this and still have a clear conscience? In James 14, James says, remember, it is a sin to know what you ought to do and then not to do it. And then some of us think this way, you know, I know that it's wrong. And I know what I'm doing is the wrong thing, but I'm going to go ahead and do it because I know God will forgive me because he's a forgiving God. And let me tell you something. God will forgive you, even approaching it that way. He will. Because the Bible tells us in 1 John, if we confess our sins, he is reliable and can be trusted and will forgive us. But there's another principle of Scripture that you just forgot. Because the Bible tells us that whatever you sow, you're going to reap. So God will forgive you, but you're going to live with the what? Consequences of that decision. So you can look at it and say, well, you know, I'm going to look at the pornography thing and I'll just ask God to forgive me. And God will forgive you. But that doesn't mean your wife will, all right? And you may live with the consequences of that for the rest of your life. You understand what I'm saying? There's a big, big important thing for us to understand. And some of us just play around with God's grace like it's a stick of candy. And I challenge us to not let that happen in our lives. But that's the way Satan starts working in our minds and working in our lives. And it's what he does that just sabotages our lives. And so you ask yourself, can I do this and still have a clear conscience? I don't know what that's worth to you, but I can tell you, I don't want to be waking up at 2 o'clock in the morning in some cold sweat, scared to death. Somebody's going to find out about what I've been doing. And I challenge you to stop and ask yourself this very important question. Will this decision violate your integrity? You know, does this violate any biblical principles? And then number three, will this decision make you a better person? First Corinthians 10.23, Paul says everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial and not everything is constructive. See, he says everything's permissible, but not everything is beneficial in our lives. Paul said there's some things that are not necessarily wrong. There, it's not necessarily a decision that's made between bad and good. It's basically between what is good and what is best in our life. And most of the choices in our lives are not really over doing horribly bad things and really evil things. I don't know too many people who get up in the morning and say, well, should I read my Bible this morning or become an international terrorist? Don't know too many people do that, you know. So it isn't like those kinds of choices that we make. Most of the choices we make really boil down. The issue is what is really best in your life? Are you wasting your life on some very second-class kind of issues and causes? You know, the question is not what's wrong with it. The question should we will this make me a better person? Will I be more effective? Will I be more productive? Will I make a bigger difference in the lives of other people? Those are the kind of questions you need to ask yourself. Will this decision make you a better person? And if it won't, then obviously that's not the decision to make. And then there's a fourth question. Will this decision cause you to lose control of some area of your life? And in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 12, Paul says again, You say, may say, I'm allowed to do anything, but I reply, not everything is good for you. And even though I'm allowed to do anything, I will not become a slave to anything. So you ask yourself, is this something that's going to cause me to lose control of some area of my life? See, whatever dominates your life eventually becomes your God. You know, and ask yourself, is this something that will become addicting to me? 
You know, is it something that will control and dominate my life? And some will say, well, Rick, you know, I'm not addicted to drugs and I'm not addicted to alcohol. So no, oh really, there are 2,000 bona fide documented addictions in this world today. And if you started working on them, you'd probably discover there's twice that many. You can get addicted just about anything in your life. And so the reality is this, that it's very important and you need to ask yourself, am I going to let anything dominate and control my life? And so when you're making decisions, ask yourself, is this something that will cause me to lose control of some area of my life? You know, that is so important that when God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, he starts off by saying, you shall have no other gods before me. God knew how easy it is for us to get addicted to the idols in our lives. And, you know, we know we've fallen into an addiction whenever something begins to dominate our lives. And what is it that we find ourselves thinking about the most? Whatever that is, is the thing that we find ourselves the most addicted to. See, when we put God first in our lives, it encourages and enables and empowers our lives. See, Paul says, I have decided I am not going to let anything, anything control my life like that. I can do anything I want to if Christ has not said no. But some of these things are not good for me. Even if I'm allowed to do them, I refuse to if I think they might get such a grip on me that I couldn't easily stop what I want to do. I think that, you know, only Christ can have first place in our life and everything else becomes an idol in our life. So it's important to ask yourself, you know, does this violate any biblical principle? Is this something that will violate integrity in my life? Is it something that will make me a better person? Is this something that would cause me to lose control of some area of my life? And then there's a fifth question that's very important. Will this decision cause you to negatively influence other people? Romans 14, verses 12 and 13, Paul says, Yes, each each of us will have to give a personal account to God. So don't condemn each other anymore. Decide to live, decide instead to live in such a way that you will not put an obstacle in another Christian's path. See, some decisions may be okay for you, but they can have devastating effect on the people around you. And one of the mistakes that many of us make in our lives is failing to understand how much our actions influence and affect the people around us. And we need to ask ourselves, if I make this decision, will it harm other people? Now, that's the exact opposite of what our culture teaches us because our culture teaches us to think of ourselves. What are your needs? And the truth is is that, you know, you need to be focused on people other than yourself when it comes to making decisions. You must remember that everything you do is being watched by people around you. All of us are people of influence. You say, Rick, I don't have a platform in my life. I don't have a lot of influence on anybody. The most... The person with the most retiring personality, those who studied it, say that even a person with the most limited amount of influence still has profound influence on about 10 people. And I'm going to give an account to God for how I influence the people around me. You know, as Christians, you ought to be interested in how your life is affecting the lives of other people. And that means you don't just live your life like you want to. You live your life focused on its impact on others. I want to share something with you that I normally only share in Measure the Man class. I want to share it with you because I think it's important. When I was 12 years old, I went to a church camp. And I went to a youth service at that church camp. And they were showing a movie on one of those big old 16 millimeter do jiggers that went click, 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 like that, you know? And it was a movie talking about the effects of alcohol on a person's life. And in the movie, they discussed how many brain cells are killed by every ounce of alcohol that a person drinks. But it's in the thousands of brain cells that are never reproduced. And that's why when a person's been a long-term alcoholic, you'll discover that many times they have a very difficult time just processing things because they destroyed so many brain cells by their alcohol consumption. And so they talked about that. They talked about its effect on other parts of the body. And, you know, and then to illustrate it, they reenacted an accident that occurred. 
and it showed a guy that would have been an older gentleman leaving a bar, obviously very intoxicated, and they showed then a young lady in her early 20s leaving a party that was very affected, where she's obviously very affected by the alcohol. Then it showed the actual footage of a head-on collision that this young lady and this man had, and then it showed an autopsy of their brains. And the older gentleman's brain was noticeably smaller and darker in color, and the young lady's brain was noticeably larger and lighter in color. <clears throat> well, you know, that day I looked at it and said, I only have one life, and I was not, a, I was not an authentic Christ follower at that time. But I made a life values decision that I only have one life. Here I'm 12 years old making this decision. I only have one life, and I am not going to waste it by becoming an alcoholic. Made that decision. And so that day, I made a decision. The only guaranteed way to never be an alcoholic is to never have the first drink. And I'm almost 57 years old, and, you know, this was a life value decision. I've never had a drink in my entire life. I think I'm a reasonably well-adjusted human being without it. Two years later, my dad was killed by a drunk driver. So that decision was cemented and sealed by titanium at that point. It was. And, uh, you know, that was not a spiritual decision. It was a life values decision. I thank God for that. About 14 years ago, one of my first cousins on my dad's side of the family died at 38 years of age from cirrhosis of the liver. I sat there or stood there by his casket looking at my cousin Mark, and I said to myself, I have a lot of the same chromosomes that he has or had. And had I not made that decision as a 12-year-old, that might be me lying in that casket right now. <clears throat> and I thank God for that decision in my life. You know, <clears throat> I understand what the Bible has to say about alcohol and prohibiting drunkenness i understand that but there's also another component and paul talks about that whenever he talks in several of his epistles about people that eat meat that's offered to idols <clears throat> and he said that um you know that there was this problem that arose in the gentile church because there were people that had been saved from idolatry and um and so they were very, very sensitive to anything associated with idolatry and the worship of pagan gods. And what happened, there was so much idolatrous worship, and they were offering animal sacrifices. There was so much of that going on, they could not burn up all those sacrifices. So they would just take a portion of the animal and they would sacrifice it. Then they would sell some of the choice cuts of meat at the meat markets for very discounted rates. And so there were Christians that didn't have an idolatry background that said, you know what, there's nothing, an idol is nothing but a piece of stone, a piece of metal, or a piece of wood. So I'm going to buy the best cuts of meat on a 50% discount because there's nothing to an idol. But what was happening, it was causing formal idol worshipers to do what? fall back into idolatry because they saw Christians exercising their freedom in Christ to do that. That's why Paul made this statement. He said, you know, that an idol is nothing but a piece of wood, a piece of metal, or a piece of stone. It is nothing. But if eating meat would cause one of my brothers to fall back into idolatry, what did he say? I won't eat any meat at all. That's what he said. Why was that decision made? Because eating meat was wrong? No. It was made because he didn't want to be a stumbling block to someone who had an idolatrous background. Does that make sense to you? And I think that it's important for me to understand that, you know, the Bible does not prohibit a glass of wine. But I will tell you this. We are all people of influence. Karen and I, our youngest son, Jonathan, <clears throat> has struggled with alcoholism for over 10 years. It's been one of the most heartbreaking set of circumstances to deal with as a family, you can imagine. He was crying to me on the phone about two weeks ago telling me he desperately wants to quit. But when he started drinking, and he was about 21 years when he started old, when he started drinking, and both of our sons are adopted, and Jonathan's biological family is just full of alcoholism 
and drug abuse, etc. And um, I believe from the very first drink, he's been an alcoholic. And when he started drinking, we found out about it. You can just imagine where I'm at based on losing a dad, you know, terrified he's going to kill somebody else's dad, you know, with his foolishness and talking to him about it. And you know what he said to me? He said, Dad, there are a lot of Christians that are drinking, so what's the big deal? I don't know, and I've purposely never asked him who it was he saw somewhere drinking that told him in his young, immature mind, go ahead and have a drink. But whoever it was was exercising their freedom in Christ and their liberty in Christ. You understand what I'm saying? I'm not, I'm not condemning that. Other than they were not thinking about the impact that it had on a little 20-year-old boy whose life has been shot to pieces for the last 11 years. All I can tell you is this. I am not going to stand before God one day and have anybody shake their old bony finger at me and say, Rick, if you hadn't drank that glass of wine at Outback and I saw you, I'd have never gone back into my alcoholism. It would have never shattered my family. I'm not going there, okay? You can do whatever you want. You have freedom in Christ, and I am not condemning. I am simply saying, I think it's time for us to grow up. And when you grow up, you stop thinking about who? Yourself, and you start thinking about your influences, what you do. That's what I want to encourage you to do. And understand, there are broken people all around us that are desperately needing our encouragement and we need to get our focus off of ourselves and on people around us understanding we have great influence my summary statement to all of that is this mature people limit their freedom for the benefit of other people Immature people don't. That's my summary statement, because I don't know how to say it better than that. And this is what Paul says about it. We who are strong ought to bear with the the failings of the weak and not please ourselves. Each of us should please his neighbor for his good to build him up. Could I just encourage us to just stop thinking about ourselves and start thinking about our influence? It'll change the decisions we make in our lives like nothing else will. Number six, will this decision enable you to live for maximum impact? Ephesians 5, Paul says, be very wise in how you live. Don't live like those who are not wise. Live wisely. I mean that you should use every chance you have for doing good because these are evil times. So don't be foolish with your lives. Learn what the Lord wants you to do. Living for maximum impact is where most everybody ought to be focusing their attention. Let me go back to this. You have one life. There will only be one February 5th, 2012 ever that you will live that is this day that is this day i either take this day and i invest it in a way that makes a difference with my life or i just throw it away and i don't know about you i am not going to throw the one and only life god gave me away i'm not going to with his help i'm going to live for maximum impact to make the biggest difference i can make with the most people that i can influence in the most positive ways You know, I want it whenever Rick Addison is lying dead and cold in his casket and people are lining up to see and say goodbye. I want it to be where people say, you know what? He took the one and only life he had and used it in wise ways. Let me encourage you to use it in a wise way. God will bless you in incredible ways, if you will. See, living for maximum impact means you choose to eliminate the better and you choose to focus on the best in your life. You know, there are many activities that I've simply chosen not to do in my life, not because they're bad, not because they're even questionable or evil. They're not. And it's not because they're not fun, because some of them are. I've chosen not to do them because I want to maximize the one and only life God's given me to make a difference in accomplishing the purpose he put me on this globe for. Living for maximum impact requires learning to manage your time. I think that some of us just simply have never figured out 
that this whole thing about time is one of the most precious commodities of our lives. I don't know where it started happening with me. I think it was somewhere after I turned probably in the middle 40s to, you know, maybe 50. But at some point you start having this weird thing that happens in your head. And you know what it is? You stop thinking about how much time you have in front of you. Start thinking about how little time you have in front of you. And how fast it's going by. And all the things that you want to do. And let me tell you something. There's a big, long list of things that I'd like to do that's really focused on the advancement of the kingdom. And my biggest concern is I'm going to run out of time to do it. And I want to challenge you to simply learn to manage your time. Understand that time is more important than money. You only have a certain number of days on this world, on this globe. And if you blow them, you've blown them. You're wasting the one and only life. And I say that killing time is like committing slow suicide. It's what it's like. So let's just get ourselves up and get started doing what we ought to do. And then living for maximum impact requires being focused on your life mission. God has a purpose for every single one of us. If you don't figure out why God's put you on this earth, I wouldn't go, if you haven't figured it out yet, I wouldn't go another step, wouldn't go another moment, wouldn't go another day without making a decision that you're going to simply focus on understanding why you're here. And you know, we've develop this growth track to help you to do exactly that and um, that's offered every month every sunday of the month at one o'clock today we're going to be meeting over in the gym at 1 p.m and i'm going to be talking about church 101 next week is going to be essentials 201 week after that it's going to be discovery 301 and the week after that is dream team 401 if you want to understand why you're here that's the place to start and it really is so see us at one o'clock today you know, we'll have a light lunch. Be there. It last, the last one I did was over five minutes after two, so it doesn't very long. So I want to encourage you to be there. Get plugged in, doing something with your life, making a difference with your life, and understanding how important it is that we really, really live for maximum impact. You know, there's no doubt in my mind that there are many of us in this room that have made decisions. Some of them have not been very good decisions, and we're haunted by those decisions. And I find that most of us probably have some area of our life where we say, I wish I hadn't done that. And here's what Jesus says. You know what? I don't care what you've done. I don't care how dumb and stupid the decisions may have been. You matter to me and and you matter to God. He'd say, I love you. I forgive you. I restore you. I can reverse some of the damage that you brought on your life and the lives of people around you by those bad decisions. I welcome you back home with open arms. I died for those decisions you made. They're already paid for on the cross. You know, if you'll just hand them over to me, the good, the bad, the shameful, the ugly, whatever it is, you know, the things you're embarrassed about, just hand them all the pieces to me, and I'll take those pieces, and I'll give you my peace, is what he tells us. And he says, not only that, I'll give you the power and the wisdom to start making the right kinds of decisions in your life, not the bad kind of decision that causes scars and shame, but the right decisions that cause satisfaction and significance. And I think the most important decision we could ever make is to just realize that God tells us, you know, none of us make perfect decisions in our lives. He just tells us, turn them over to me and start making the right decisions. And if you'll apply what we've talked about, God will bless you in a special way. Stand with me, please. If you have areas of your life where you just are, you know, right now having to make decisions and you've been challenged by that, I'd encourage you to just come and let me pray with you that God will give you just his wisdom in making those decisions. And then I want to invite you, if you've got other areas of your life you're concerned about, whether they're physical or financial or relational or spiritual, whatever they are, just come and let us pray with you. Because I know that God wants to do something very special in your life. Why don't you come now? <clears throat> Come on around. Just come on. God, we come to you today very aware that you are here with us at this very moment wanting to do something very special in all of our lives. And Lord, I know that in this circle and in this room, there's a lot of us who've made some decisions that we just wish we could undo. 
And I pray today that you would just help us to realize how much you love us and how much you care about us as individuals and that you have provided a way for us to experience freedom from guilt and regret and condemnation. And God, we just simply surrender those things to you and we ask you to forgive us for making decisions that were not the kind of decisions that would honor you. And I pray today that your Holy Spirit would work in a powerful way in every one of our lives as we just simply turn these things over to you where we would experience your peace and would experience your strength and would experience your joy. And then, Father, I pray for those who are dealing with other problems in their life, whether they're a physical problem. And I know, God, some of us are dealing with some very acute physical issues in our lives. Some of us are dealing with relationship issues that just seemingly get more complex with every single day. And I just pray that today we would surrender those to you. And then, Father, I pray for those that are us are dealing with financial issues that, that we just can't seem to find our way through. May we on this day find you to be the source of strength and hope that you promised to be. We put every need in your loving care, and we pray that your Holy Spirit would work in a special way in each of our lives. And then, Father, I just pray for those who do not know you personally, that today they would simply surrender their lives to you and say, Jesus, thank you for loving me so much that you died for my sins, that you paid for those bad decisions that I've made. I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to come into my life and to change me from the inside out. I surrender my life to you today, and I want to live in a way that honors you. And Father, I just pray that all of us in this circle would experience the warmth of your love and your care in our lives. And we place our lives in your care now. We ask this in the strong name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Give somebody a hug and tell them you love them and Jesus does too. All right? <clears throat> God bless you. God bless you. Sure enough, yeah. God bless you guys. God bless you, Cindy. God bless you guys. All right, you may be seated. <laughs> I want to thank you for your attention today, and I just encourage you to let God work in a very special way in um, these areas of your life. And there are several things I want to share with you. We're going to worship the Lord in just a moment with our offering. But before we do, I want to remind you, that in October, our elders made a decision that we were going to take the first 10% of every non-designated dollar that is donated to the church. That's everything that comes in as tithes and offerings, that we were going to take the first 10% and we were going to distribute that to other ministries, both internationally and locally. <clears throat> and we've been doing that now for about four months. And during that four-month period of time... Because of your generous support of the Grace Place, we've been able to donate so far over $70,000 to various ministries. Ministries, you know, you know, supporting ministries in Africa, Alaska, Bolivia, South America, Fiji, Haiti, and the Philippines. You know, locally we've been able to support CareNet Crisis Pregnancy Center, and we've been supporting Love and Hope in Action just up the street. We've also been supporting two Christian colleges that are preparing to gather about a thousand young people to serve in ministry, both, you know, internationally and in churches in the United States. You know, and it's because of your generosity that we've been able to do that. And, you know, looking at where we're at right now with what is going on, I think there's every reason to believe that in 2012, the Grace Place is going to be able to give about $200,000 to ministries outside of the Grace Place. It has nothing to do with us personally, but outside of the Grace Place. That's because of your generosity. So I want to remind you that when you give, what you're doing, it's not only God using that to support the ministries of the Grace Place. He's using that to make a huge difference in ministries all over the place. And I would tell you that every single week I'm getting letters and emails and cards from these various ministries that we're supporting telling us what an incredible difference it's making in those ministries. And, um, you know, it's people we don't have the opportunity to know or to serve. That doesn't matter. It's not people that will ever walk through these tunnels and come in this room. But they will enter into the kingdom of God eternally because of your generosity. So I want to really say I think we need to have got a great big hand for what he's doing. <clears throat> So 
So I want to encourage us to remember as we give what's going on and how God's using that. And, um, and I would challenge us to give generously because as you do, we're able to give more generously as well as a church. And um, so I'm going to ask the ushers to come while they're coming. Remember, you can use this envelope to make a donation or take it home with you and mail a donation in. Or you can go to the Welcome Center, not the Welcome you can go to the lobby and make a donation at our giving kiosk. Or you can go to, um, or you can go online at any time and make a donation there. Several other things I would mention while they're receiving the offering that's important for you to be aware of. CDs of this service are available before you leave today. Um, go to the Welcome Center. There is no charge. There's no charge for those CDs. We just want to say thank you for your support of the Grace Place. And um, if you're a first-time attender, please stop by Guest Central in the lobby. We'd like to give you a gift and just say a big thank you for your um, for your being here today. And then um, remember that today I'm teaching Church 101, as I mentioned a few moments ago, at 1 p.m. in the gymnasium in the Connection Center. Last Thursday, I started Measure the Man class. Had a great group of guys out, but you can still get plugged into that. That's 7 o'clock on Thursday evening, and I want to encourage you to participate there. And, um, and then we have a very special treat coming up in a little over two weeks. The Collinsworth family, who are just an amazing family and um, amazing musicians, they're going to be here for a concert on the 24th. It's a non-ticketed event. They are extremely well-known. Kim Collinsworth is probably one of the most incredible pianists I've ever heard in my life. And um, she was actually voted gospel pianist or, or pianist of the year um, two years ago. And it is something you do not want to miss. It is, because it's non-ticketed and because it's being advertised all over the Internet and on various other sources, um, there will be a tremendous number of people here. I would encourage you to get here early um, because you'll need to or you're going to wind up in the gym watching it being piped in over there. And so I want to encourage you to come. There's no tickets to it. We will be receiving an offering and let other people know about it as well. Then Barry and Eileen Friedman asked that we would support this benefit that they're putting on for Ark of Martin County. They're selling tickets in the extreme east end of the lobby. Stop by there across from the, um, the coffee bar. And again, I want to thank you for your incredible attention today. And I trust God will really, really bless what we've been able to do today in worshiping together in all of our lives. Please stand with us now and let's join, Tom, um, let's join John in lifting up the name of Jesus um, as we celebrate his goodness in our lives. we got one more time to worship the Lord before we go out and face our week. Let's start the track and let's worship him. Our Redeemer. What happened? Wow, that was a lot shorter than we thought. We're going to start it over. We're going to start over. All right, we're going to do this twice, I guess. Go. I know he rescued the soul. His blood has covered my sin. I believe.
God bless you. If you need further prayer, over to my right, there will be someone there to meet with you. If you'd like to take part in communion, to my left over here, there will be a communion served. God bless you. Have a great week.